This is perhaps one of the coolest things you can buy as a civilian. The Autel Evo 2 Dual 640TV3 incorporates an iRay 640x512 thermal camera and takes it airborne. Start with the main feature of this drone, the 640x512 thermal camera. It gives you all of the advantages of having a thermal imaging device, but now it can fly. Let's see what it can do for you. Firstly, it makes reconnaissance or surveillance at night shockingly easy. Anything that's alive or produces heat above background will be seen by the thermal imager, regardless of the lighting conditions. Also, being airborne means you can scan a large area of land in a short amount of time while putting considerable distance between you and whatever it is that you're reconnoitering. So, how sensitive is this thermal on the Altel drone? Well, Altel hasn't really provided a NETD figure in the brochure and the rep I know at Altel also doesn't know. But being that the thermal module is an IRA 12 micron unit, you can be pretty sure of its performance. To illustrate the sensitivity, let's take a look at the kayakers on this river here. In the thermal mode, you can actually see the warm trail of water being left behind by the kayakers. And no, these aren't motorboats, these are human-powered kayaks. The thermal is sensitive enough to see human body heat transfer from the human through the kayak and into the water. And, in addition to its sensitivity, the iRay thermal core is also precise enough to be used for radiometric temperature measurements. Yup, you can use this drone as a flying thermometer. And, similarly to industrial thermal imagers, the thermal core on this drone supports selective area average temperature measurement, hotspot finding, cold spot finding, and you can also just designate a single precise point for measurement. And it is as easy as tapping on the screen at the precise location that you want to measure. Also, like most decent industrial thermal imaging devices, you have quite a lot of color palettes to choose from. In addition to the regular white hot and black hot palettes, you also have the Predator Vision Rainbow Palette. Don't ever use this. They also give you an even higher contrast rainbow palette, which is even worse, and also Iron Bow, which is a lot more useful. Lava is simply just Iron Bow but high contrast. Arctic doesn't really look that much better. Global is basically the white hot palette but red scale. Graded Fire is good for art, I guess. And Hottest is basically just the white hot palettes but with red highlights. And alright, being sensitive and precise is good and all, but what about actual detection ranges? Well, let's take a look. At a distance of 800 meters, you can pick out vehicles pretty well, but human-sized targets just tend to blend into the background. You will need to close into about 600 meters to be able to detect human-sized targets. And yeah, moving human targets will be easily identifiable at this range, but if they're standing still, then they may be a bit hard to pick out from the background. For rapid and easy human target signature identification, you really need to move into a range of around 400 meters. Alright, next, let's talk about the drone's visible light camera. In addition to a 640x512 thermal core, the drone also incorporates a half-inch 12-megapixel quad Bayer array CMOS sensor. Being a quad Bayer sensor, it has four photodiodes under each micro lens and color filter assembly. This allows the sensor to do things such as reading out all four photodiodes as one to combine the signal to create better low-light performance, it can also expose the photodiodes within each pixel differently to boost dynamic range. Or, finally, the camera can also read out the four photodiodes separately and remosaic the pattern to create a final image file that has four times the resolution. 
In terms of photography, the drone can shoot in both JPEG and RAW in both the 48 megapixel remosaic mode and the 12 megapixel regular readout mode. And to be honest here, I really do not see the point of using the 48 megapixel mode because firstly, even though the 48 megapixel RAW file does have more pixels compared to the 12 megapixel regular readout file, these extra pixels are all interpolated from remosaicing calculations and they do not really give you extra effective resolution and this is apparent when we demosaic the RAW files. In fact, I'd argue that the 48 megapixel mode looks even worse compared to the 12 megapixel mode due to all the added readout noise and the interpolation artifacting. The 12 megapixel mode is also better for low light since its max ISO is twice that of the 48 megapixel mode. And you also get a respectable 13 stops of dynamic range when using the 12 megapixel mode. In terms of video, the drone can record 4K up to 60 frames per second and 8K up to 25 frames per second, but never use the 8K mode, it just simply doesn't look good because, like in the photo mode, the 8K in the video mode relies on remosaicing. And you can also get 12 detectable stops and 10 useful stops of dynamic range when shooting 4K video. The relatively flat and unsaturated color profile of the video also means it's easy to color grade. However, this camera does have a major drawback. It kind of sucks in low light, meaning you can't really use it for nighttime surveillance. But then again, that's what the thermal camera on this drone is for. But the little CMOS camera can actually help with surveillance. The CMOS camera does have a much larger field of view than the thermal camera, so they included this picture-in-picture -picture mode that lets you scan with your thermal while maintaining situational awareness of your surroundings. The 12 megapixel effective photo resolution of the visible light camera also gives you some photo reconnaissance capabilities. Also, whenever you take a photo using the visible light camera, the thermal camera also automatically takes a snapshot and saves it to the card. Now let's talk a little bit about the drone itself. At 1.15 kilos of takeoff weight, it is one of the largest and heaviest foldable drones out there. However, it is still easily portable and rapidly deployable. And yeah, for a 1.15 kilogram drone, don't expect FPV levels of agility. However, given a good signal, the controls are extremely responsive, and if you've flown any DJI or other brands of drones, you'll be right at home on the hotel. The controls are simple and precise. The drone is also pretty fast. If there are no headwinds, it can reliably achieve a speed over ground of over 70 kilometers an hour. And well, just for fun, this kind of speed does give you some limited pursuit capabilities. And in terms of command data link and transmission, this drone is actually really impressive. It gives DJI OcuSync a run for its money. Here, I've gotten to 7 kilometers, and we still have 4 to 5 bars of signal. Yeah, for this drone, battery endurance is going to be much more of an issue than transmission strength. And speaking of battery performance, let's see how well the battery in this drone holds up through a typical mission profile. Here, we're taking off to do some photo reconnaissance of a site roughly 2 kilometers away from the takeoff point. And yeah, winds today are really strong. Take a look at the artificial horizon. Look at it jump around. The drone's motors are working very hard to keep the drone stable in such intense winds. And yeah, with a fully charged battery, we were able to get the following. Number one, a two and a half minute flight with a tailwind towards the target, roughly eight and a half minutes of playtime reconnoitering the target, before a four minute flight into headwinds back to the takeoff point, while also landing with 15% battery in reserve. 
I honestly expected a drone this size to have more endurance, but hey, we were flying in extreme wind conditions, so hey. Next, let's talk about the obstacle avoidance system on this drone that is enabled by 12 vision sensors dotted all around the drone, giving it 360 degree by 360 degree coverage. But yeah, this obstacle avoidance system is a little bit of a mixed bag. While it does work quite well when given enough light, and is definitely super helpful if you're trying to land a drone in confined spaces. It is also quite stupid, it can only stop the drone from crashing into obstacles, it cannot navigate around obstacles like what DJI drones can do. Also, this obstacle avoidance system simply does not work in the dark. It needs at least 15 lux of illumination to work, which means it stops working the moment the sun starts to set, and it cannot even work with ambient city lighting at night. And oh yeah, probably because this drone has pretty big propellers, it is actually a lot quieter than I expected it to be, especially for a drone this size. And lastly, let's talk about the controller that comes with the drone. My bundle came with the Altel Smart Controller SE. This controller has a 6.4 inch OLED display with 800 nits of peak brightness that is actually quite usable even in direct sunlight. Also, granted, while this controller is nowhere near as comfortable or refined to use as DJI controllers, it is still light enough and comfortable enough to hold that you can actually fly drones for an entire day using it without tiring out or getting annoyed. However, this Altel controller does have a massive advantage over DJI ones in that this Altel controller has removable batteries. This means while yes, each battery only lasts 2 hours, you can swap it in the field to get more flight time. Also, if a battery degrades over time, you can just swap it out cheaply. And that's pretty much it. Many thanks for watching. safely landed.